Hello. Now I want to talk about the war in Ukraine with a special aspect on Putin. And this is a speech I gave at a meeting in um, Marston Hill the 13th of October 2022. <laughs> that was difficult. Uh, it's based upon an article I wrote in the think tank Tvertent. Uh, it is uh, this article. Uh, and I wrote it uh, two or three weeks after the invasion. So it was in the, in, in the beginning of March. Uh, and a um, lot of things have happened since then which of course has updated my presentation. And as you see, there are some other articles written by Gudman Bergqvist about the war in Ukraine. Uh, there are other debate articles also. You see, you have debate, debate uh, here, and you can access it with, with that URL. This site is written in Swedish, uh, so... Um, if you are not Swedish uh, talking, well, if you copy the text and put it in Google Translate, you got a fairly good English translation actually. It works much best, better that way than the other way around. Uh, my presentation is divided into two parts. The first part discusses the method and the other part discusses the analysis it in itself. Uh, the first part describes the method, uh, which I call System Theoretical Analysis, STA. Um, there I first describe what is a system. I talk about relations between systems. Uh, after that, I discuss the analysis part, and, and so finally I evaluate uh, the method asking, is this science or not? Uh, so, system. Uh, these are very common definitions. I, I think you know them. I've heard about them already. Uh, the most common definition is, a system is a number of components, with relations between them. And there are three important elements, of course, a number, components and relations. Number indicates that the system consists of a finite number of components. This means system can be defined in an alternative way. A system is something you can put within a border. Uh, the interesting thing is that, logically, these two definitions are the same, but they look very, very different. Concerning border, there is always someone who sets the border. That means a system is always defined by somebody. Uh, this does not mean that system uh, can't be objective. Take for instance a car. It consists of a number of systems. Chassis, drivetrain, interior, electrical system, etc, etc, etc. All these systems are physical, changeable and easy to describe. But different car manufacturers can call them uh, different things and have slightly different definitions. Components can in turn be systems, and systems can be subsystems in larger systems. So in order to manage all this, two boundaries must be drawn. One that defines the smallest components that are taken into account, and one that defines the overall system. This I call system borders, upper border and lower border. 
the behavioral system can change significantly if you draw the borders differently. And you can also change the division into systems so the total system behaves completely different. Uh, let's take car as an example. The usual way where we think of a car is a yes it has a part, drive line, it has another part, interior, and other parts, chassis, tires, electric system, etc. 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 Um, and these systems can in turn be divided into smaller systems. So drive line has part engine, gear has part gearbox, has part transmission, has part clutch. Uh, and this is one way to consider a car as a system. Every box here is a system. And they can divide it into subsystems, principally down to bolts and nuts. We also see all relations are of the same kind, has part. Uh, but now I will define car in a completely different way. I say car is a status symbol, a car has emissions, a car causes traffic. And status symbol can divide that into uh, consists of horsepower, price, brand and speed or all uh, issues systems that define status symbol. Emissions mm -hmm. uh, they can be of different kind. There can be emissions from the engine, can be emissions of CO2, of particles, and we have emissions during manufacturing, and also emissions during destruction. Uh, so this is one system of a car. Concerning traffic, uh, traffic causes pollution, causes congestions, supports commuting. Um, and this is a total other view of the system card. Here we have different relations, they are not of the same kind. Uh, and each system, each subsystem is described in the same way. So Describing a system, that it's much like asking a question. Because when you ask a question, you ask for something. The question becomes a request addressed to the person or things that are being asked. But the result of the question can be very different depending on how the question is formulated, to whom it is asked, and in what context it is asked. Uh, similar things apply to a system. Based on a certain view of existence, certain world view actually, and thus also in a certain purpose for a certain public. That's in the context where you define a system. Very important is to make the borders clear, both outer border and lower border. Uh, so you have to make clear for yourself what the chosen system division actually means, what you want to say with it. Uh, I have another example from one article I wrote concerning gang shootings in Sweden. So I have taken a part of a picture from that article. It is in Swedish. Uh, uh, if uh, we have something we call eget boende, 
uh, for asylum seekers, they can either be uh, placed on a special um, living, uh, maintained, managed by the immigration service in Sweden, but they can also say, I can fix my own living. Uh, and of course that, you fix your own living, your friends, relatives, that say, oh, you can, you can come and live with us. Uh, so this ability, this uh, uh, possibility, I should say, can lead to ethical homogeneity. Uh, and this ethical homogeneity in areas where we have Swedish people also, uh, they might lead to conflicts. The homogeneity reinforces conflicts. Swedish values can lead to conflicts. If conflicts occur, well, they can deepen. Uh, they can make people stick very much more to their own values, which increases the conflicts. Uh, so we have a reinforcing loop here. Also, this ethical homogeneity uh, might lead to the clan and family supports and encourage the uh, own va values from the asylum seekers. So this is basically what I said. This is the, the analysis. This is the story. Uh, and you can actually read that yourself in, in the copy of the slides you have. Uh, this analysis is by no means a complete analysis concerning gang shootings. It describes a system, a subsystem, the living. There are many similar systems, school and education, work, attitude to authorities, etc, etc, etc. And all of them must be analysed in a similar way in order to get a holistic view. And in my article I take up a few more subsystems in the analysis. What is the advantage of system theory analysis? Well, it is a method with a mixture of design, of system science, and actually history science also. I have here said history of ideas because that's what I have studied. But it's a general, pop, uh, um, general oh, I can't find the word, uh, a general uh, property, attribute of historical science. Uh, assistant theory analysis that's not a traditional scientific determination of dependencies. There are dependencies, uh, there can be dependencies actually, uh, but the analysis is a model of a phenomenon. And keep in mind, a model is a simplified description of a certain phenomenon develop for a certain purpose. Uh, creation of a model belongs to design science and the model must be distinguished from reality. It is not the reality. But in the same way as a map describes the terrain, the model in an STA analysis describes some part of reality. Uh, the division into subsystems, well, that system science, uh, and history of science come in the analysis, where the, uh, the system analysis should form a convincing and strong story. The story should make sense for as many people as possible. All three aspects uh, produce, in the best case, a 
powerful story. Well, you see science, in a traditional meaning, it is not. It's not possible to empirically verify the story. Maybe after some time, if that's a prediction, as I will predict the result of the war, it can be verified after some, while, some time. The interesting thing is, is the story a true story? Does it correspond to reality? Uh, the creation of the model is based upon facts, either from my own observations, from reports, from other scholars, from journalists uh, of different kind, movies, pictures. So in that sense it corresponds to reality. But the creation process of the model, it is based upon the sun science, which is a form of science, but not a traditional positivistic science. Uh, validation of the model is possible insofar as the description makes sense and describes phenomenon that has occurred and can describe phenomenon that might occur. Uh, but, however, the model is not a general truth. It's my apprehension and description of a certain specific phenomenon. The purpose is, I have said earlier, to understand the described phenomenon and the story shall make sense for as many as possible. It should be a dot after possible, not a comma. Uh, this example was developed with the aim of showing the background to conflicts in immigrant and dense areas. It shows that values driven by the families are driving these conflicts. But uh, how can the conflicts be resolved? How can they be prevented? That's not described in this model. But what happens if they are not solved? We see that in form of shooting deaths and gang crime. But that's another presentation. Now I will talk about Ukraine the war in Ukraine. Here I define three subsystems. Background to the war, the war itself, where I concentrate on two subsystems, the armies and the sanctions. And the final subsystem is the result of the war, a bold prediction, actually. Uh, I have two assumptions. I think, I assume, it was Putin himself who decided to invade Ukraine. And Putin is the most powerful person in Russia. Uh, I know these assumptions can be questions. There are people who don't agree, but they are assumptions my analysis is based upon. So, the background. The first part of the background is megalomania. Uh, Putin started his career at KGB in the old Soviet Union. There he learned that Soviet was a big country, incorporating several other countries, was a powerful uh, part in the world. When he became president, Russia was considerably smaller. But over the years, Putin has have developed megalomania, and he wants to restore the old Soviet imperium. Uh, he has said that many times, and uh, many journalists and, so and Russian experts agree with, with this claim. Next is the greediness. Putin is rich. He is one of the richest person in the world, 
may be even the richest. But he uses decoy in order to keep it secret. Uh, he's also very greedy. There is a famous story where a general showed him a gold medal he has achieved for some something he has done and Putin took it, looked at it and put it in his own pocket. Uh, Russia is also a thoroughly corrupt society where government material is sold for money. Uh, it is not talked so much about Putin's greediness, uh, but the fact that he is one of the richest person in the world makes him vulnerable for sanctions. Uh, and therefore he has agents, banks, institutions, persons, etc. who manage his money so they are spread out uh, rather much. Uh, the pandemic and advisors. Well, we saw in the pandemic that Putin was very afraid of being contaminated. Uh, we had this extremely long table when you should visit uh, a place, uh, a hospital, he was uh, dressed in heavy protection clothes with his own uh, air uh, supply and uh, was looking like a, uh, an alien actually. Uh, so uh, the pandemic may have contributed to Putin's view. Uh, and it has con contributed to this view being decisive. Uh, Putin was very isolated and socialed only with his closest associates. Uh, and as a leader, he is extremely dominant. And if you say against him, if you don't obey him, you lose um, your fortune, you get imprisoned, and maybe you, you lose your life also. So people are very afraid of making him upset. Uh, and this leads to he gets to know what is his consistency with his perception. Uh, you can compare, for instance, uh, IBM and uh, uh, PCs, they did not realize the importance of the PC. You can uh, compare Fawcett and um, with the mechanical uh, calculators with the electronic calculators. Fawcett did not realize that the electronic calculators should completely take over the market because the decision makers did not get the information. It was filtered away in, in the way up in the hierarchies. So advisors don't dare to tell something that Putin does not like. And this applies to several levels. Uh, and the most consistent advisors become more influential since they had access to Putin. Uh, and I can't help making a comparison with Donald Trump. Uh, Putin made a speech in the night of the 24th of February, which is described as incoherent, untrue and alien to reality. His mental health was questioned. Uh, the same happened with Trump. His reality was described as alternative facts. And it became even more clear when he claimed that he had won the election, the Democrats had rigged the election and an unprecedented scale uh, uh, cheated. Uh, despite the court showing there was no such cheating at all, Trump claimed it was and incited a mob to attack capital. Uh, Putin's rhetoric in the speech before 
the attack on Ukraine is very similar to Trump's rhetoric after the election loss. Uh, the outside world, uh, when Russia helped the rebels in Georgia 2008, the world reacted uh, only by condemning it. Uh, they were not united at all and did not make any big inventions of those other things. When Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula, the outside world reacted in the same way, uh, diplomatically, partly with a boycott of goods from Crimea. Uh, the pro-Russian President Yankovic was disposed and fled to Russia. So, consequently, Putin did not count on any major protest and no united reaction from the outside world. He thought it could, in very few days, occupy and take control over the whole Ukraine. Uh, he called the invasion a special military operation, so he could use the National Guard to that. Uh, and the government in Ukraine, uh, you say there was Nazis, and in operation he should denazificate them. Uh, and the situation of the Russian people in Donbass and Luhansk was described as a genocide. So the Russian National Guard thought, well, it was just an exercise that you'll be welcome as saviour of the oppressed people in Donbass and Luhansk. Uh, uh, yeah, this is how it all started. Uh, the speech I've talked about, uh, the reasons they are so patently false that a normal person does not believe them for a single second. And Putin also behaved very strange during the speech. Another reason to question his mental health. So now we have the background and here is the system theoretic analysis. Uh, Putin's background in KGB supports the idea of Big Russia, which develops megalomania. Uh, what happens in Georgia in 2008 and Crimea 2014 uh, creates the idea that it should be an easy occupation. Uh, and all these most of megalomania, the easy occupation, supports the idea of recreate big Russia. And to recreate big Russia, well, you need to invade the former Soviet republics. And that means not only Ukraine, but also other, but start with Ukraine. So this is a back of reasons for Putin to start the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there is another way of seeing it also. This was Putin's way. Here we have uh, some more factual description. Ukraine or to join, join the European Union. Um, it uh, applied for, for being a member of it actually. And that is seen as a threat to Russia. And that's one reason for Putin's speech. Uh, external observations indicated the range, but that could be another reason for Putin's speech. Uh, the speech contained the nazification, concern, contains genocide, and that motivates invasion. Uh, Invasion means special or military operation, uh, as he said himself, but 
I use the proper word here. The war. Uh, what happened? The Ukrainian army made fierce resistance. The Russian army had great problems because of malfunction of material and the transports. The logistics does not work at all because the money allocated for maintenance has disappeared into the pockets of the maintenance personnel. So the tires were bad, there were, were no maintenance on the motors and, uh, well, they f fell apart. Uh, and USA, NATO, USA again, and the European Union united themselves in a sharp criticism of invasion. They sell the weapons to Ukraine and heavy sanctions to Russia. And this was completely unexpected. Uh, and also the problem with the Russian army. And I think it took some time for him to, to, to get to know that because of his fair of, of his associates to, to re report what actually happens. Uh, but eventually Putin was informed about the real situation and then he started to destroy civil targets and after that concentrated on the infrastructure because he was superior in the air and in the artillery. Uh, and there might be some small signs. Uh, I think, what week is it now? Uh, two weeks ago, he talked about Ukrainians in a quite new voice. He called them partners. Uh, he did not talk about the, the electrification or or such things, and uh, he uh, made some, some, I think, uh, stop shooting and letting human help uh, enter the country. So we see signs that eventually possible, perhaps might be interpreted as some sort of trying to make peace. But it's very hard to, to say anything. The Russian army. Due to corruption, there was several lack of maintenance, leading to huge transport problems. The officers, well, they were not very well educated, and the command lines did not function at all. The soldiers were not motivated. They thought, it was only an exercise, and there were lots of alcohol abuse in the whole army on every level. Uh, so, the Russian army has lack of material, has poor command, has lack of motivation, has alcohol abuse. Corruption leads to lack of material, leads to pure okay, poor Occasion, ed poor education, should it be, which lead to poor command and lack of motivation. So we see, basically, corruption is the main reason for the failure of the Russian army. Uh, also, leads to uh, should be interpreted is one of many reasons. There could be other reasons also. The Ukrainian army. Well, it was a huge army and it was well trained. Uh, they were built up since the invasion of Crimea 2014. Uh, and uh, they were very motivated because they defended their motherland. 
they were smart in their warfare also. For instance, young boys used their drones to sabotage the trucks transporting gasoline to the troops. But the Ukrainian army lacked modern weapons, uh, but those were supplied from the West, actually. Uh, so, the analysis of the Ukrainian army, uh, it lacked modern weapons, uh, it is bigger than expected, it is well educated, it is well motivated, and it is creative. And that was because the invasion of Crimea, actually. So, a short STA over the world. Now I have got some coffee here. My wife provided me. Thank you. So, the invasion, we start with that, did not lead to the expected result. Uh, it inserted the strong sanctions. The expected results, which were not achieved, lead to attack on civilians, uh, but the expected result did not occur, so lead to attack on infrastructure. And all of this lead to insertion of yet stronger sanctions. The problem is now how long can the Ukrainian people sustain all these attacks? It is winter, it is getting colder, it is snowy, and how long will they uh, resist? Uh, weapons. The Russian soldiers, they were not very effective. They, they often ran away, actually. But the Russian artillery and the Air Force was supreme. Uh, Ukraine received weapons from the, from the West. But in the beginning, they were not advanced. They were rather simple surplus weapons. And especially air defense was lacking. Uh, of course, UN, NATO, European UN, uh, USA, I have forgotten to mention them, all condemned the Russian invasion. The unity was so total, uh, which surprised Putin actually. And heavy sanctions were issued towards Russia, not buying their gas, big banks, including the Federal Bank, were excluded from the SWIFT system, making payment in foreign currency impossible. No semiconductor stuff was sold to Russia. Many companies withdrew from the Russian market. Uh, Russia was excluded from several uh, sports events. Uh, so, uh, I have here made a STA of gas sanctions. Uh, that leads to less Russian gas was sold, which lead to uh, lack of gas. So the price of gas increased, leading to Russia earns twice as much uh, uh, when there were no gas sanctions. Because Russia sold uh, steel gas to, uh, to European countries, especially German, uh, and they earn twice as much as before, which went directly to finance the war. So gold gas sanction failed in the first phase. Uh, the price increase of gas leads to electric eel price skyrocketed. It leads to increased prices uh, in overall 
leads to inflation, leads to increased poverty. So these sanctions backfired uh, because European Europe were too much dependent on gas supply from a single vendor, Russia. And the same can be implied on Russian oil, uh, but not to that great extent. Uh, the economic sanctions freeze money, companies leave Russia, uh, the ban to sell certain parts, and uh, uh, closing of SWIFT. Uh, all arrows here means leads to. Um, I don't run that because it's the same everywhere. Uh, the freezing of money and the companies are leaving Russia and this SWIFT lead to reduced trade with uh, Europe and USA which lead to Russia increase their trade elsewhere. especially China and India. The ban to sell certain parts lead to lack of spare parts, which will in the long run uh, diminish Russian industry. Uh, the closure of SWIFT uh, made reduced tourism as well as the freezing of money. Uh, so the Economic sanctions uh, uh, the economic sanctions are all long term sanctions. So let's look at the latest news. Well this was two weeks ago. Today it is the twenty fifth of November. Uh, the Russian Minister of Defense, Sergei Shku, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, he said the 9th of September that Russia will withdraw their forces from Shazong. Uh, it was very slow. President Zelensky is skeptic. Russia has claimed that Shazong is forever a Russian region. Uh, I think this should not be 9th of September, it should be 9th of November or something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that date actually. Uh, now, interesting questions. How will this withdrawal from Chasson affect the war? How will Putin be affected? Uh, concerning the war, it demonstrates a superiority of the Ukrainian warfare uh, if the supply of weapons and ammunition continue, which it seems to do. Um, it's a huge prestige loss for Putin, but he might benefit from it, since he controls the whole use mechanism of uh, in, in, uh, Soviet, in Russia. Uh, so, uh, here is some sort of idea. Big Russia, biased information and national apprehension, appreciation, influence Putin uh, to, uh, to this uh, uh, invasion. Uh, but there was no success in the war, uh, and uh, that leads to Putin want to get out of it. Uh, so he found a supposed motivation. I take care of the soldier's life. So he decides to withdraw from Chasson. 
And since it's, he controls the invasion in Russia, it leads to people accept the withdrawal because they are tired of the war. And they also, in that sense, accept the mobilization. But the withdrawal was disliked by nationalists. Uh, so there could be some pressure on Putin to do something else. And the withdrawal was in fact uh, not a real withdrawal. They regrouped their forces to one side of the river uh, running through Chasson. So uh, keeping the troops on one side make it much easier to defend. So Chasson is a divided town. Uh, the analysis is Putin wants to eliminate the loss of prestige in the withdrawal course. He controls all official information and can pretend to save Russian lives by this withdrawal. Uh, the mobilization and lack of stuff from the West make the Russians tired of war and I strongly support the withdrawal. Thereby, Putin strengthens his position for a while, but there are nationalists lurking behind the curtain. We don't know what happens. So, I came to the final part, the result, a bold prediction. The key is Russia's isolation. This isolation will lead to hard conditions for the people because of the lack of much important stuff. Also the oligarchs will suffer because they can't travel, they cannot get hold of their money. Uh, but there are also nationalists that share the idea of Brick Russia. Uh, all this will, in the long run, lead to revolt and Putin will be forced to leave or will be executed or, or assassinated. The big question is, who will win? The people or the nationalists? So, uh, the war lead to United EU and NATO, lead to sanctions, which lead to Russia isolated. That will lead to hard living conditions. Sanctions uh, make uh, rich people no access to money. Uh, China might help Russia. Might. Uh, I'm not sure, but it can lighten the sanctions. But China does not help for nothing. It puts some demands on Russia. And in practice, Russia can be liege of China, which also will force Putin to retire and resign. So, that's a result. In summary, uh, Ukraine wants to be a member of EU and all this background with Putin that creates, leads to invasion, which leads to sanctions, which lead to war. In respect to the result, Russia will be isolated and as a result, Putin will be overthrown. Uh, so in my model, the sanctions play a critical role. In the long run, they will create such a bad status in Russia, for which Putin is held responsible, and this will overthrow him in one or another way. Uh, 
but can the Ukrainians resist increased bombing, destroyed infrastructure and less help from the West? Probably not. Ukraine probably have to relinquish Donbass and Luhansk as independent states, recognized only by Russia and Belarus. Uh, but in any case, the sanction Russia will continue and have effect in the long range. I don't think NATO will invade due to the risk of a full-fledged not, not, nuclear war. And that ends my presentation. Thanks for listening and have a good day.